Hello, folks. Welcome to Scratch the Surface. I'm EJ Scott. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, Today, my guest is Rick Andrews. Rick Andrews was my teacher at the Magnet Improv Theater in uh, New York City. Uh, I spent a little time in New York, and I thought, maybe I'll take some improv classes. I'm I'm rusty. I haven't done it in a while. Um, And the Magnet was offering a a one-week intensive workshop six hours a day for five days. And I thought, ooh, that sounds like a lot of improv in in a short amount of time. Sign me up. And I did. And uh, and while I was taking the class, I thought, oh, maybe I'll ask Rick to be on my podcast and we'll talk improv and comedy and stuff like that, fun stuff like that. And we do. And we talk uh, even more. We talk about uh, how he met his girlfriend and where he's from. Um... All sorts of good stuff. So, uh, bo- 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 oh, and before I introduce that, you can find me on social media. You can find me on Twitter at EJ Scott or the podcast on Twitter at EJ Podcast uh, because at Scratch the Surface is really long. Um, I have a website, ejscott.com. I'm on Instagram, EJScott1106, uh, and I'm raising money for charity. So you could go to crowdrise.com slash seven on seven. That's the number seven on the number seven. And pick from uh, about a dozen great charities that I chose um, and give whatever you can. Give whatever you can. I'm sure there'll be something there. You'll be like, oh, yeah, I know somebody that could... Benefit from my donation, I think. Um, so check that out. Uh, also, I'm in a documentary called Running Blind. Not blonde, blind. <laughs> um, it's on iTunes. It's on Google Play. It's on Amazon. Digital copies of, of this movie. It's a 30-minute short. You can rent or buy it for like two or three bucks. Very, very reasonable pricing, I think, uh, if I do say so for myself. Uh, what's it about? Well, it's uh, about a man, that man being me, um, running 12 marathons in 12 months in 12 states in 2012. Blindfolded. What? Um, I am losing my eyesight to an eye disease called choroideremia, and I'm legally blind now. My grandfather was blind. My mom's a carrier, my brother has it, my sister's a carrier, and her two boys have it. So I'm always trying to raise awareness and do something and raise money um, for this cause. So luckily, uh, Ryan Suffern, a talented editor and director, um, helped me out and made this great 30-minute documentary. And... uh, it's definitely worth seeing, I think. Um, I think even if I wasn't in it, I would say that. So uh, go check it out if you can. And uh, now, on to... On with the show. On with the show. Uh, enjoy my talk with Rick Andrews. How's it going, Rick? Good, how you doing? All right, thanks Ooh. for coming over. Whoops. Did I already screw something up? Yes. That's water in there. That was totally my dumb move. I'll keep the water further away from me. Well, that's interesting. Is he whining now? All right, I think I'm going to just grab him real quick. Put it in a nice pan. I think he'll whine less. Hi hi. Hi hi hi. Hi hi hi. Hi hi. Bear, bear, bear. Go. Bear. <laughs> Is that frightening? Yeah. <laughs> like a giant dog just like. Oh. <laughs> He's very social. He loves new people. What's his name, Banner? Yeah. That's a good name. After, uh, I'm, a, I'm a big nerd. So, uh, I named him after the Incredible Hulk. Yeah. Hence, there are incredible Hulk <laughs> standee right there. 
that somebody gave us. Uh, but I'm looking to get rid of it. If you have any interest, it's yours. Wow. I don't know that I have the space because that is a life-size <laughs> uh, Incredible Hulk. Yeah. Um, uh, thank you for being here. Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, you, you teach at the Magnet. It's true. You've been teaching me for the last week. That is also true. Uh, I've, I've taken an intensive, and um, we have, I have a show tonight. Very true. Very exciting. Um, where do you what, what, when do you perform? At uh, currently, I perform uh, once a month or so in the Armando Diaz Experience, and then I do my my regular show is uh, with Lewis Cornfeld on Sunday nights called Cornfeld and Andrews. And that's our two person show, and we try to take our time. Yeah, <laughs> it's pretty slow, much the, slow, the setup uh, for the show. Slow uh, improv. Yeah, it, it doesn't necessarily stay <clears throat> slow, but we try to start in a genuine place and not push it. So we kind of let it go wherever it goes. If the world we've inhabited appears to be silly, just through our intellectual capabilities of not being able to fill it in with enough reality, then we give into that. We let that happen. Um, so we try to just let it be whatever it's going to be. Well, how long have you been doing improv? Uh, almost, so I think that's 17 years now. Almost coming up on 18. Oh, 17 years, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. A long time. Yeah. Did you start in New York? I started in Boston uh, when I was a kid in uh, middle school and did improv at this theater called Improv Boston mm-hmm. up there. Um, I think I've heard of it. I think I know it's probably some people still around, have yeah. done stuff there. Hi. Huh? That's my girlfriend. <coughs> that's Deborah. I'm six, I <laughs> <laughs> Um, uh, so how can I ask your age? Yeah, uh, I'm 14 now. 14. So I <laughs> Wait, started so when I, yeah, <laughs> um, I just turned 30. Uh, so I started when I was 12. Really young, okay. Yeah. Wow. Um, and, uh, the, uh, I used to watch Who's anyway on, on Me like too. the British reruns on yeah, like Comedy yeah. Central. So that was my only knowledge of improv. And then my dad found some listing, uh, of for the this improv theater and we went down and saw a show and it was like a they used to have Sunday afternoon shows at Improv Boston mm-hmm. and we were like I don't know why that's a horrible time for a show <laughs> uh, but we were the only like four people who showed up you know and they were like oh we usually cancel if there's less than ten people but we'll do it anyway so they like did a show like basically just for like me and my family <laughs> and it was great yeah. and I really loved it so I kept coming back with I brought my friend Mike back and we went just started going to see shows like a lot and after maybe a month or two of just being down there all the time, the like artistic director was like, you guys should take classes. I Did think they, they really needed some money. Yeah. <laughs> like, they needed more people in classes. Yeah. Because, like... We'll take anybody. Yeah, uh, I mean, like, <laughs> I can't imagine putting two 12-year-old boys yeah. who know each other. That's even worse than two 12-year-old boys who are strangers. Yeah. Uh, into an, a, a level one class with adults. <laughs> I, I, at the time I was like, this is great. Like I, it didn't even occur to me that we were obnoxious. <laughs> we were like relatively mature 12 year olds, but we, I mean, we're still, yeah, you know, 12. that would put us at like 15, right? My, I mean, we so my nephew just turned 12. Yeah. It'd be funny. I wish he was in improv, but, um, not with other adults. That might be weird. It can be tough. Well, it, it can be tough for, I think Mike and I lacked the, um, embarrassment of like, you know, I think it's it's gonna be tough for the kid too because it's like you don't know, you know, it, adults have way, way different references than you do. Yeah, right. Like playing Hot Spot, I was like, what are all these songs? Like, yeah. and I even listened to like oldies radio, and I was like, I don't even know half of these songs. If somebody comes up with like the word mortgage, and you're like, where is a mortgage? Yeah, I remember <laughs> doing a scene where someone had baked pot brownies, and, <laughs> and I still don't. I don't. I still have never done any drugs but I I know about them now I think at the time I was like I remember my character went in and like had one and I basically reacted as if I was on cocaine or something like I started like freaking out and getting really hyper and I remember the teacher being like good to know you've not done drugs yet that's (laughs) it's good to discover um we used to take we would take the commuter rail in Boston down uh, I, I I was I got an early cell phone because of this so my parents for a while would drive us down but you know it's like a long drive and we were going down a lot. So they let us ride the commuter rail and 
we, I had like this really old like brick cell phone that was like a huge, you know, right. you had to clip it like to your pants, you know, like wouldn't really oh, yeah. fit in a pocket. Well, you, know, you still have a flip phone. I still, <laughs> still do, yeah. It's that phone. <laughs> um, but so I was like early to the cell phone game and then I've, my, my progress has stagnated with the flip phone. But yeah, we would, uh, if I was going to jump on myself, I would like listen, it had like AM, FM radio on it. On the phone? On the phone. So I would like plug my headphones in and I would listen to like WAAF. I like have the distinct memory of hearing the, the tool song Schism like over oh, and over yeah. again, but never cat and like liking it, but never catching them saying what the song was. Right. So like every time on the train, I would be like flipping through the stations trying to catch that one song um, so that I could actually hear who it was so I could download it off of Napster. <laughs> um, uh, Napster, uh oh. Oh, yeah. Uh oh. I confess, I'm not uh, an officer. <laughs> so you're born and raised in Boston? Uh, yeah, I, I, I was born in Connecticut and then lived outside of Philadelphia for, for a while until about age 10. And then about, about age 10, I moved outside of Boston. So I I'm, I'm, did most of my formative growing up in, outside of Boston. And how many siblings? One sister. One younger or older? Younger. And what did your parents do? Why so much moving around? Um, my dad does like... Uh, business stuff in like biotech uh so he would work a lot with i think startups like basically guiding companies through the business side of like an fda trial um so with that i mean i don't know exactly why there were like periods where he would be not not have a job for a a big chunk or he would like only i remember there's a period where he had uh, he got a job and it was like the only job he could get in the biotech was like in New Jersey. So he like flew down to Jersey like every Monday and then like flew back every Friday oh, wow. for maybe a year. For a long time he worked for a company in Japan. So he would go like every three months he would go over to Japan for a couple of weeks. Wow. Um, but they, I think like in that industry sometimes it's like, well, the company either like runs out of funding, you know, like the trials don't go well, like just the science isn't there or like a bigger company kind of buys, like the goal is to get like a big company to buy it, you know? Right. Um, so they all have like slightly limited time frames. My mom is a nurse anesthetist, so she works at uh, various hospitals. Um, so there was only really like two moves. Like the move, okay. um, the move to, from Connecticut to Philly was. I was very young. I don't remember it very much. I think they moved around a lot before that. I, I was even born. They lived in New Orleans, lived in Chicago for a little bit. They were both from Tennessee. Um, so there's they they bounced around, um, but I have a lot of memories of living outside of Philly, and then we moved we moved to Boston. Um, when I was 10. Did, did you like Boston? Yeah, I really did. Um, did you go back often? Yeah, I tried to. Folks still there? Yeah. Um, my dad now lives with his girlfriend outside of New York in New Jersey. So I get to see him more often now. Oh, okay. My mom still lives in Boston with my sister. And she's going to retire in the next couple of years to a cabin she has in Tennessee. She like grew up in Tennessee. She has this like retirement cabin in the Smoky Mountains that she's wow. been kind of preening off the grid yeah um luckily it was spared in the recent wildfires oh jeez. um it was kind of not in that area but it's uh so yeah she's she's up there for for right now then she'll be moving down to tennessee well when did your parents split up um when i was in ninth grade i think well, pretty they are the most amicable like i've never seen them like fight and they keep like they were just like oh we're gonna not we're gonna get divorced <laughs> and then <laughs> my dad moved like 10 minutes away mm-hmm. we used to do all the holidays together and things like that it's so it's it's not really like yeah it doesn't too hard yeah it wasn't like a a broken home when, when he i mean let's see ninth grade he said what is yeah. that 15 something 14? like that yeah so you know what divorce is at yeah. that point so do you, when you hear that word do you get scared my parents have stayed together there the whole time but my i think my sister was upset uh, she was a little younger. Right. Uh, I think at that point I was kind of like, like putting pieces together. Um, of like, okay, like I, uh, you know, they, they're like going to all these, I remember them like going to a bunch of appointments together. I was mm-hmm. like, like counseling or something. I have no idea. It could have been Parents. counseling. It could have been like lawyer stuff. Mm. Um, but I was like, that's, that's odd. But I, I think I pieced it together. Um, so yeah, they had been sleeping. They were like sleeping in the, the different rooms for a little bit, and mm. so it was a. I didn't. I didn't like pry into right, it too right. much. I was just kind of like, all right. Yeah. Um, but I, I think in like, both like a selfish way, but also a, a way that maybe it was 
a credit to them. I was kind of like, like it didn't really affect me to be honest with you in a weird way. Like they were, they were still both really loving great parents and there was no like a- a- acrimony. Right. And there was no, nothing really about my sister and I's like lives had to change that much to adjust to it. Sure. Uh, I think they really went out of their way to like make sure that, that everything was stable for us. You know, my, yeah, my dad was 10 minutes away. Right. We would live at his place for two weeks. We'd live at her place for two weeks. I don't know that even there was even like mm. a court mandate. I think like they worked it all out. It wasn't oh, like, wow. you know, like I don't, I don't think I, I mean, maybe there was a court date, but right. I, that would be news to me. I think it was just kind of like they agreed. Well, either way, it's thing. impressive that they could make it so amicable, you know? They're great. Yeah. Yeah. Um, did your mom ever date? Go back to dating? Yeah, she has a, a, a boyfriend. Okay. Um, she dated some guys. Um, the because when they remember. split up, what are they in their thirties, forties? They they were in there. Yeah. No, no, they were. Oh, they were in there. Yeah, I mean, so I was fifteen. I think they had. They were thirty three when they had me. Thirty five. Okay, so they were like the fifties. Yeah, late forties, early fifties. Okay. Yeah, I don't know why he's in there. Yeah, <laughs> they had me when they were fifteen and fourteen. <laughs> They had um, kids at about the time I started doing improv. That was the <laughs> that's the time on there. Um, were was your mom dating or your or either, I guess either of them dating while you were still a kid, like living going back and forth living with them? Yeah, um, trying to think exactly. It was all like because that's weird. That part's got to be a little weird. It was fine, honestly. I don't really? know. Yeah, like they weren't. No one was like. <laughs> This is your new dad, like that. That is, you know what I mean. Like, Did you ever go up to someone and go, "Are you my new mom?" Yeah. <laughs> Probably as a joke. Um, I, I think my mom had a boyfriend for a little bit. We didn't really like him, but not because he was like new, because he like sucked. Yeah, and I think that was short lived. I think she would agree to that. He was just boring or something. He just was like, I don't know that he was like super trusting. He was like okay. a weird. He had a weird. He had like some. Weird vibe. Weird vibe. Um, the, uh, but yeah, the, um, it, it wasn't like they were like living in my house. Right, right. They would go on dates. What's your sister doing now? She works in substance counseling. Um, yeah. So she uh, runs meetings. She works in halfway homes. She like uh, helps match people coming out of uh, detox with. Um. Uh, what's the word? Uh, uh, the right, what comes after detox? Uh, whatever. So we're living. So, yeah, with like a, a rehabs. Rehabs. Yeah. Yeah. That's the obvious word. Um. <laughs> uh, and she's getting her uh, degree in counseling. Oh, wow, that's great. yeah. How'd you get into that? Uh, from from being addicted. Okay. To stuff. Uh, There's an addiction in my family. Too. Yeah. Um. She's amazing. Uh. She. Uh, is three years sober and, and it's just awesome and has been super strong through everything and oh. had and dealing with some medical issues like her back has been really messed up uh, and, uh, and even through all that been been really strong with stuff and has immediately kind of turned into yeah like giving back to those communities and wow. and yeah she's she's great good for her yeah and it's funny you said that she you've never done a drug I have never been high or drunk so how, how do you think pretty you, strange how do you think you avoided whatever I don't know I uh, I don't like the taste of alcohol mm-hmm. that's that's a big one I think mm-hmm. um, I uh, in high I was when I was a little kid I had a really bad ADD mm. and I was I was really bad at improv because of it like I couldn't focus listen to yeah. anything <laughs> anyone would say right um, you know if some I'd be in a scene and they'd be like, did you hear him say that we're in an office? And I'd be like, nope, I did not hear that. <laughs> nope, was, did you hear all the stuff I was saying? Yeah. <laughs> and and when, you hit, when I hit puberty, like, it actually I think is, is, is common. Like, it, in, your, your brain chemistry changes, you know? And so that can sometimes, basically, I think my ADD started to go away. Um, or like the way the medication was affecting me was, was very different. Like I remember really f- being able to feel when I was on it and feeling very like blunted and subdued. And I really didn't like that feeling that like taking a thing kind of changed me in a way. I didn't, I didn't, 
you didn't feel like you. Yeah, and and the, the idea that especially it was some outside thing that it wasn't like through an experience I was having or something that I was kind of coming to on my own that I was like taking something and then that was like modifying the way I was experiencing stuff. I just it didn't seem it seems it didn't seem like I had negative associations to that. Hmm. Um, so when people started drinking, that was like my main association to it. And I think I had some, I had a an early girlfriend who had some close brushes with alcohol poisoning and Ooh, and stuff that was geez. they were just like. Uh, unpleasant experiences like that that they, they weren't like positive i wasn't forming a positive relationship so like drinking it, it and so i also think too improv like i didn't really have much social anxiety i didn't really have many friends in high school i i had a lot of friends from my middle school that i i still was close with but they went to a different high school mm. and and almost every my high school like sucked yeah uh, <laughs> i just didn't really i ended up getting more it's so funny how I feel like our personalities are very context based. Like in middle school, I was like, uh, h- hang out with a close group of friends and, and was friendly with a lot of people and loved to joke around. And in high school, I didn't really vibe with most of the people. I ended up being like the smart kid, quote unquote. Like I just like took a lot of classes. Right. And, and, uh, and that became like my identity in a weird way that like was not my own. I don't think I really, Maybe I'm, this is just in my own head, but I remember not liking that. I don't think I really leaned into it. Like, I, I, I was never, like, the smart kid in, in my other school. Hmm. Um, it just was, like, everyone in my new school, like, the school, like, no one was, like, interested in anything. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. I think that's common in high school. <laughs> like, I had a really kind of smart, passionate group of friends in middle school who, who were all, like, interested in stuff. Like, it, it's, it's more fun to be interested in things, but I think everyone in my high school is, like, they were interested in, like, doing chewing tobacco right, and right. like the wrong stuff and or like not even that just like just doing nothing like it right. wasn't even like partying or whatever it's just like lethargic apathetic like just no one cared about anything right uh, so i don't know like <laughs> that i was like interested in in english class or whatever was like no i'm this market yeah <laughs> Do you know what i mean just like just not even trying just like right you were even trying you're not you guys aren't trying to do anything so i guess I'm and in a lot of it too like i was in like advanced placement <laughs> classes but like wasn't doing great in them but i was like in classes with a lot of the great above me i was actually closer oh. to a lot of those people i was like in ap calc as a junior and most people took it as a senior if they took it at all uh so like that, but I like got like a B minus, you know, I got like C plus B minus, you know, like I like didn't like math. I didn't like AP calc. Um, so it wasn't like I was like, I have to get A's and everything. Like I, I was not, there were people, and, and most of the other people in the advanced placement classes weren't, I think the, for the majority, it was people who were perfectionists, like mm-hmm. that, that, that had a lot of pressure on them to, to do well, but weren't that actually interested in stuff like I was always a really intellectually curious kid and I, I think at that point it, it wasn't about competition I wasn't like oh I have to get good grades I have to be I have to be looked at as smart right um I really don't like that vibe and you ended up studying psychology I did in, in college yeah right and so you wanted to be a therapist or something no yeah I studied social psychology so it was like research psychology okay so I actually studied uh in grad school, I was studying like political attitudes, mm. like formation of political attitudes, maintenance of political attitudes. So it was like a political psych uh, spe- specific uh, area. Huh. Um, but it was no, no yeah. So like the, the, all that stuff would be like abnormal psych, like you know, being a therapist and you know, uh, doing therapy. I have like mixed. There's a, so there's such a wide range of of therapy, and and not a lot of it is. Uh, there's a lot of ideas out there that aren't empirically validated or even thought to be tested. Right. So it's like a the my interest in psych was in the more sciencey, okay, uh, areas less like yeah less Freudian, developing my own theories of how people's brains work and more like how does the brain actually work? Do you analyze when you watch this year's political race? Do you analyze uh, <laughs> Trump? Oh, God. I mean, my interest in politics was always, like, someone's interest in a car wreck, you know, where you're like... It's pretty appropriate this year. Yeah. I just read... I've been I'm, I've been pick, picked up Consider the Lobster by David Foster Wallace, which I've already read. What's it called? Consider the Lobster. Consider it's a book of his essays. Okay. Uh, 
I just love him. I I feel like I've reread most of his stuff by this point. Um, but the last essay is about political talk radio and about right wing talk radio. He wrote it in two thousand four before he died. This guy John Ziegler, who just sounds like a menacing asshat. But so much of it is about like the like media landscape and and like facts versus opinion and like. Reading it made me. I was like, man, if this dude was alive, he'd be so sad because it's like it's so perceptive for what's turned into, and it's just been it's just such garbage. Maybe it's maybe not much has changed in the last two hundred fifty years or whatever. You know, I mean, I think it has. Like in so in the um, something I didn't even know. So talk radio, like which is the is the birth of this like fake news stuff. I mean, is the original is like conservative talk radio. It's like the the, the um, the first area where that like Rush Limbaugh stuff, you know, it's right. like blending blending news and, and entertainment without any real onus to back up your 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 facts with right. your your Proof statements with facts. Anything. Yeah, you're just saying an opinion like a fact. So there used to be this show, or there used to be this rule that um, that Reagan Reagan really deregulated everything uh, as, in a bad way uh, <laughs> across the board. Uh, I knew about a lot of the financial stuff, but but the big thing was like in in media was he uh, he took away a lot of like, um, uh, what's it called when a company owns too many companies like monopoly monopoly stuff and in the in the FCC he like deregulated it so there used to be this fairness law you had to if you get had a three hour show like the the airways were like pu- a public good that like mm-hmm. a, a, the radio was viewed as a public good so if you had a three hour long conservative talk radio show. You would then have to have a three-hour-long liberal talk radio show. Like you'd have to. There was a, a balanced yeah, doctrine that yeah. that the stations were required to adhere to up until the '80s, and also you could, there were there were strict limits on how many stations a company could own. So all of a sudden, you had all these companies. You know, you had a clear channel. You know, mm. you know, you went from like thousands of different stations to like now like you know ten different companies owning all the airwaves, right. and you could syndicate these sta- these shows like the Rush Limbaugh show, which was cheaper for the station. And better for ratings, right. and you wouldn't have to counterbalance. You didn't have to counterprogram three hours of you know, mm-hmm. um, the Tavis Smiley show <laughs> for three hours of Rush Limbaugh. You know you, um, and so that really like led to this boom in like conservative talk radio. Mm. Um, it's Rush de- Limbaugh. depressing. They're making a Limbaugh movie. You know that? Great. With John Cusack as Limbaugh. Oh, that's fun. He has to gain some weight. I think he probably will. Oh, or CGI is. it. Um, so, uh, you started doing improv really young. Did you just do that through high school and yeah. college? Did you do it in college? Yeah. Um, I did it at Improv Boston all through middle and high school. And then I did, uh, I did improv in college in my, in Suspicious of Whistlers was my college group. I went to Wash U in St. Louis and that was great. I really love that. This is a great experience. Um, and, and this was all short form stuff? No, it was all long form. Oh, long form? Yeah. Improv Boston was short form for the first year or two I was there. And then this guy, Will Aware, took over and, and started bringing in a lot of long form. And they did a lot of really just interesting cutting edge long form stuff way before. They were doing like developing kind of a new show every month. And they, they would do like full sets and costumes and, and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. It was really cool. I remember they had this murder mystery called like Red Herring and it was they had like these huge trunks of costumes and they would kind of get suggestions at the start and then they would pull on these costumes and be those characters the whole show. It was really cool. Mm-hmm. Um, they had a show called Quest that was like a Dungeons and Dragons fantasy adventure okay. type show and it would carry over from week to week. So it was improvised hmm. but like every week they would pick up. Where they left off. Yeah, it's really cool. Huh. So I did long from college um, and when I got there, I, I didn't even know there was a long form team. I was kind of expecting to have to like start it, you know. Like I really wanted to keep doing long form. I was kind of bored with short form at that point. And but there was a long form team that had formed like maybe a couple of years before, and they were really great. They were like very like raw. Like there was not they hadn't had like a ton of training, but they had like a really they had like a spark, and they like got they they got the like playfulness of everything in a way that I think is challenging. I think. In college, everyone's like intuition is to like yell over each other and like try to out funny each other, and, and <laughs> this group was like out of control, but like in a playful way, and so it was just a really fun team to be on. Um, Did and, you know that you wanted to pursue improv as like a career? 
that wasn't a thing and still yeah. really isn't <laughs> a thing. What'd your parents think of the improv that they... But, yeah, very sportive, yeah. Um, I mean, it was always the thing that I loved the most of, of what I got to do. I mean, it was always my favorite part of the week mm. as a kid. And in college, I really loved doing it and performing with my team. And I, I like, directed the group last my last two years. Um, and, you know, like, trained. That's my first time teaching was, was uh, training the new people, you know? So you would take in kind of the, 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 the challenging thing of a college improv group is like, it's like a, it's like a sports team to a certain extent, you know, it's like, well, you're, you're losing your, your seniors every year. And so you got to like have turnover, like you, you get very bonded. Um, but college teams also rehearse more than like quote unquote professional improv groups. I mean, we rehearsed three times a week. Wow. Um, That's a lot. yeah. And so you get, you get really bonded. You, you just get a lot better or quicker. Um, so yeah, you were taking people, freshmen that maybe had a little experience doing improv, but maybe not. Maybe they just had like, seemed like apt to it. You know, we have like big auditions every year. When you're younger, you're more excited about it. You have the time, you have the passion yeah. for it. And as you get older, you know, like a lot of the, you have other stuff to do. You have other stuff to do. And you're like, <laughs> I've been doing this a long time. I don't, I don't need to rehearse three times a week. Yeah. <laughs> um, it would be great if we, if we did. I mean, I think like, there's these stories of like when mother was a team here in New York, mm. you know, Armando was directing them and they rehearsed every day, you know, supposedly huh. that's the like yeah. urban myth. <laughs> um, or like, you know, cause they, they, like, there was a period where like none of them had jobs. Like they were all just like auditioning and trying to do stuff. Right. And so they just meet up with Armando, like, you know, uh, many times a week and rehearse. Um, do you remember any of the people you watched in Boston that you liked? Um, from Improv Boston. Do you remember any of their names? Oh, yeah. Um, I just saw... So, Will Luera it was the artistic director there for a long time. He lives... He artistic directs at a theater in uh, Florida now. Uh, he is awesome. One of my favorite people. And I get to run into him at festivals and stuff uh, at their teaching, which is really fun. Um, uh, there were... Don Sherman was was around a lot. Him and his wife Elise were both performers there. They were really wonderful. They're still in Boston, I think, tangentially involved in the theater. Um, Matt Gagne uh, was there for a long time. Um, at the tail end of when I was in Boston, Rachel Rosenthal was out there, and she now, she's now in New York teaching. Um, Robert Wu, he wasn't there. We didn't have a ton of overlap, but he, I know him decently well from, from Boston and then from traveling around. Um, yeah, I mean, there's so many, so many okay. people. Yeah. Uh, can you tell, why do you still have a flip phone? Um, I don't, I have a really bad addiction to dumb games. Okay. Uh, so like, look, I got like pretty hooked on like Minesweeper in college. Okay. Which so is like, what does that mean? Is that a flip phone game? Minesweeper is like a computer game, but it like comes with your computer, you know? It's like where you're clicking on the spaces and then like one of them's a mine and it blows up. It's right. like a little logic game. It's dumb. But I like would like play for like five hours straight and my eyes would hurt. And like I don't even, I'm like, why am I even, you know, it's just like, I think it's easy for me to get sucked into those things. Sure. Okay, so, so it's you're, a avoid, little bit you're of, avoiding smartphones. It's a little bit of a protective. I see. Um, and I don't need to have a smartphone. And like, uh, I've never just been, I've never like been moved to get one like, to a certain extent. Like I kind of like, I, you know, I also like, I'm on my, I'm on the computer too much. Like I, I check my email too much anyways. Like mm-hmm. I'm, what, I feel like, or something yeah, like I feel like I'm so busy. Like there's constantly things that I like could be doing that don't have to get done like right now, but that like should get done at some point. And right. I think like when I go, it's just, it's hard to relax if I like am constantly on and connected to that because like opening my emails like essentially opening up a to-do list and it just was like oh yeah I have to do that like it just sends like you get these like anxious waves you sure. know sure. so I just don't have it and I don't need it like I don't need directions in New York <laughs> it's pretty simple if I need to get directions somewhere I'll just look it up beforehand mm-hmm. or every other human on the planet has a smartphone so like yes, worst right. case scenario the only circumstance it's so it's so funny like Lewis <laughs> Also doesn't have a smartphone. He has the same. He's a flip phone, and 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 just he doesn't like 
he doesn't want people to like always be able to reach him is like his thing. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's still people can still reach him on the phone, but I think like email, he doesn't want to be like on email all the time. Texted, you get, I guess you have text him. Yeah, phone, right? but he like makes it clear he doesn't want people to text him all the time. <laughs> <laughs> He's like runs up my bill. I don't have unlimited texting or something. <laughs> Um, but when we travel together for festivals, that's like the one time where I'm like with somebody, like we were like at the airport and we needed to like look something up and we were both like, oh, we both <laughs> were the, the we exact it. wrong person, you know, to, yeah, it's but it's like, you know, something like that'll happen like once a year. So it's like, I really, I, I haven't felt the strong need to get one. You think how long, how much longer do you think you could hold out? As long as it'll keep working. Yeah. Um, I don't know. It's nice. I like, I like not. Having all that shit, yeah. Um, Being a slave to it. I, I I read on the train, which I wouldn't do if I had a smartphone. I'd do work yeah. on my phone. Yeah. Um, it's it's just nice. Uh, being able to disconnect a little bit, and I've been really trying to like get off Facebook recently. Like I have to have Facebook. It's it's too useful to like, keep in touch or to like for networking stuff. You know. Yeah. You know keep connected to people I meet when I'm traveling or things like that. There's just no other way to really yeah. do that efficiently. But I like going on the news feed, like especially this election, it was just like, yeah, yeah. I would just get angry and I'm like having, like I know better than to get in a random fight with some idiot yeah. who's I'm not sure even a friend of mine. Yeah, <laughs> It's like a, f- a friend of a friend of mine. It's one of their like idiot friends yeah. <laughs> who they probably aren't even connected to and right. is posting like, why am I going to get... What's the point? Yeah. That's so, happened on mine thing where somebody I went to high school with will be a Trump supporter or right. something like that and write something on an article I post or something. Right. And I'm like, I don't, why? I haven't seen you in 25 years. Why are you, <coughs> right. why are you writing this now? Because you got to know, man. Pizzagate. <laughs> Pizzagate. Pizzagate, man. First of all, it sounds delicious. Sounds like a delicious <laughs> fake conspiracy. <laughs> right. Um... So you have a girlfriend? I do. How long have you guys been together? Four years. You're living together? Yeah. In sin. In sin. Um, <laughs> uh, where had you meet? She's a student? Uh, she, she, no, she's a teacher at the theater. She teaches at Magnet. Where does she teach? Well, uh, your, level, one. Level, level one. Her name's Hannah Chase. Hannah Chase. Um, so yeah, we, she was a performer. When we met, um, she was a performer at the theater. Um, Sparks? Sure. Fireworks? Yeah. All that stuff. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Do you guys ever improvise together? Uh, yeah, uh, rarely. Like we don't. We're not on. We're in different teams. She directs. Um, she's on a, a really wonderful house team called the Music Industry. They're fantastic, and she directs a show called The Cast, which is on Saturdays, which is a really awesome show. They like it's like noises off improv, so it's mm-hmm. like you're seeing like a play get put on and then like you're also seeing like the actors like behind like backstage during the play. Oh, that's funny. That's and they do like a different genre every week. It's oh, really fun. Cool. Uh, it's an all female cast. It's a really strong group. It's a really fun show. And they do like, yeah, they, it's fun watching them do, they like become like mini experts in like all these different genres. Yeah. So every week they're like kind of mastering a new thing and putting it up. It's really cool. You ever think of doing a duo with her? <clears throat> um, Nah, <laughs> I love improvising with her. It's yeah. just like uh, I think I'm always wary of like doing. You know, like I don't. If we like, what if we have a bad show? You know what I mean? Then I don't want to. Like we're gonna be like grumpy together. Yeah, I don't know. It's just like it's nice to keep things separate. Yeah, to okay. be honest, like uh, so we, when we get to perform, it's like such a treat. Like we 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 when we take vacations, we. Uh, We'll sometimes do shows together, like if we're because we're like we did like a show in Montreal and we were on our vacation, and that was really fun. And uh, we did like a Valentine's Day show last year with Lewis and I had uh, Megan and Hannah both sit in, which was which was a really fun show. Megan's his girlfriend. Yeah. Okay. Um, so it's nice, like it's uh, we perform really well together because we're we know each other very well. What uh, did you ever see Weird Ass? You know Weird Ass? Yeah, Bob, uh, Bob Weir, right? No, yeah, and Steph, and Stephanie. Steph Weir and Bob Dassey. Bob Dassey, there you go. Yeah, um, they're great. Yeah, they've you know they're married. Yeah, they're just a great uh, married couple that does amazing improv. Yeah. together, you know. Yeah, it's nice. I feel like um, part of it, like I, uh, my whole like my work and my um, fun, and then also like my personal relationships it's like all contained within one sphere mm-hmm. so I like <clears throat> always like a little 
wary of like just like everything's like so contain like close. So it's like it's a little. It's nice to like be able to like have. Like when I, when we're together, like what, I, we don't want to like rehearse and do improv. <laughs> it's nice like go do other stuff. You know what I mean? Like because it's it's uh, uh, a couple of friends of mine, Craig and Carla Kakowski. Oh yeah, friends of mine as well. You know them, uh, or otherwise known as Orange Tuxedo. Yeah, um, they're like touring. Yeah, right now they're every time I go on Facebook, they're like, "We're in Utah. Oh, we're in great. this place, and we're doing a show." And now they they also do a podcast. Yeah. Together. Do you know that podcast, Craigslist? No, yeah, that's a great name. Yeah, it's a uh, that's a good. That's a I'll plug his podcast. I think if both of us weren't doing improv like every day, we would yeah, be much it. just much more. I mean, it would be we would be doing stuff together, but we both like teach and perform pretty much every day. <laughs> so yeah. it's like it's just like it's nice to have a break. Yeah, no yeah. Um, uh, so four years together, what? Well, how often do you get back to Boston? Are you going back for holidays? Um, Hannah and I try to travel during... We, we, it's hard to make vacation time because I basically... You know, you, you teach full-time. You don't have a salary. Do you teach, like, every day? Probably? How many days? Pretty much. I have teach? eight... I have... Uh, right now, I have ten classes a week. Uh, I teach Monday nights at the Magnet, Wednesday nights, Thursday nights, Uh Twice on Saturday, twice on Sunday for Magnet. And this week you did the intensive. This week I had the intensive. And I also have a weekly class at Columbia and a weekly class at McKinsey. Um, and then I have one-off corporate stuff and coaching and things like that. I don't do anything on Tuesday. Tuesday is like my day off. Okay. And Hannah's as well. Um, so we try to take vacations around times when there's not going to be classes anyways. Because okay. otherwise, right. you need to take two weeks off. It's like your vacation now costs double what it was going to cost because yeah. you're also not getting paid for two weeks. So, so this year we go around the holidays, so like Christmas time. We, I, I, you travel I stopped a lot going this home. year, yeah. right? Because you told me you only had to do, you could only do this podcast like pretty much now because you're leaving out of town in a couple of days. I'm going to teach in Hawaii uh, in a couple of days, which is all very tragic. That's I'm cool. very upset about it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Do they put you up or? Yeah, they're amazing. Sweet. Yeah. What place is this? This is in Maui, uh, Maui Improv. Maui Improv. Uh, a former student of mine um, moved out there and started it, and it's been going strong for a couple of years. This is my third time going out there. Wow. Um, you go out for a week? Go out for a week. Megan comes with you? Uh, Hannah. Oh, Hannah um, she went with me the first year, and then she went back on her own and taught for a week um, as a teacher. Um, she is not coming with me this year because. They're, they're, you know, they don't, they're not paying both of us to teach. Right. Uh, so it's like a bit of an experience. She's like her work and class and stuff still winding up, so she couldn't come out of time. But she is meeting, I'm flying from Hawaii to Japan, and she's going to fly to Japan. We're going to meet mm-hmm. in Japan and have a nice vacation out there. So you'll vacation, you won't teach in Japan. No, she's going to relax. What part? We're going to figure that out. Okay. <laughs> We're I going just, to Tokyo. I went to Tokyo this year. Yeah. The first you can give me straight. some tips. Because oh, we know we want to travel around, we definitely are going to. Um, God, now I'm blanking. The other, the uh, Temple City, Kyoto, uh-huh. it just sounds awesome. Everybody says to go to Kyoto. So we're trying to figure out if we're going to take the train around or if we're going to rent a car and drive around. Mm. Um, they drive on the other side over there, which you know, I got. They, they have a huge public transportation yeah. system. I like driving, and the thing that appeals. I'm like now just like planning my vacation on your podcast, but. <laughs> <laughs> like the thing that appeals to me about that is like you can kind of stop and the you know like I, I want to like get onto the countryside a little bit and like you know all these little seaside towns and stuff. Uh, so I, I like the idea of having a car for that yeah. and not just That's having to true. go from city to city, you know, with yeah. the train. Um, you can always use the car when you need it and take public trains when you don't. Right, like once we're in a city, if we yeah. you know just take the train around. Uh, but I don't know. I've, I've never. I don't know how far one place to another is over there. Do you have you? Do you know? Japanese or anything? No. Yeah. I don't eat. I don't eat fish, so that's gonna oh. be a, 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 a It's gonna be a ten days of discovery. <laughs> you a lot of noodle fish? bowls. No. Oh, you're not gonna try. It. I just like don't like. Uh, there's something about the taste. But still, all fish taste different. All different types. No, of fish. it all tastes fishy to me. <laughs> there's something in there. There's like a whole series of things that like. There's like if there's like a taste some taste bud thing that like. I read online, this might just be total BS, but it was like... Fake news, Rush Limbaugh. Yeah, it was like, 
super taster or something like that, which makes it seem like you're tasting better, but it's, it's really like a bit worse. You, you like have like a concentration of taste buds in areas that are not normal. And then they like, listed a list of things that like, Oh, if you had this, like you don't like, and I like didn't like any of them. Right. Like alcohol is like a big one. Right. Like, alcohol tastes awful to me. And I know it doesn't taste good to like most people, but it tastes cooler. like have a wine awful. Cooler. Ugh, everything's <laughs> disgusting. And people are like, Oh, try this. And I've gotten this like hundreds of times. So I was like, no, 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 you just, this is like, try this chocolate Bailey, whatever. And I'm like, wow, this tastes like candy plus ass, like awfulness. <laughs> like, let me just have the t- juice drink. I don't want the juice drink with the awfulness yeah. in it. Like you, if, it tastes probably like, better. It tastes like someone, it tastes like, po- it is poison. <laughs> it is yeah. poison. But it's like, it tastes like I'm being poisoned. Like, the, like someone took a fruit drink and like has messed with it. But then there's like olives was another one. Oh, um, I, I hate olives. Seafood. I'm trying to think what else was on the list of, of weird things that I really don't like the taste of. Um, do you have a texture issue too? Yeah, I'm not. I was I was a very picky eater as a kid, and I feel like I've s- very slowly. I feel like I I learned to eat a new food when I'm like hungry and like starving, and that's the only thing I can eat. Yeah, like I never ate like lamb until I was oh. like in Paris one year and like on a trip and like there was like nothing open except for this like hero place that like had like lamb heroes and I was like I was like I haven't eaten in like 12 hours I have to you know what I mean and now I'm like all right this tastes pretty good yeah um but until then I was like ah icky yeah so you never eat ventures that way no I like if I have a restaurant I mean if I go to a place and I find a thing I like I will order the same like I will go to Pio Pio Rico and get their like half chicken french fry salad like once a week I don't get the same thing. Like I go to dig in, I get chicken with Brussels sprouts and mac and cheese. Like <laughs> once a week. Like it's just like if I find that habit, You're I will creature, just. Are you a creature of habit like that? With food, especially. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think a lot in a, in a lot of other ways too. But I also do like. In, I like wandering around too. Like so, I'm not like. I like run a lot, and I really like running in new places, and mm-hmm. I love to just go out the door and explore. Uh, so I really dig that. New York's a great place to just explore. When did you start getting into running? I ran in high school, uh, across country, but like not well. Yeah. I mean, across country in high school, sure. It's like three, you know, five K's, but like I wasn't good, you know? Right. Um, you don't have to be, I'm mean, like, what do you mean? Not good. I mean, all you have to do is just run. Yeah. I mean, I was like, by senior year, I ran like, Low, like 19s for 5k which is like a fast for like a normal person but like not not like i'm not competing in the race like i'm sure. not winning the race i'm not anywhere close sure. uh i'm barely placing for our team kind of stuff so i ran and i ran on my own in college but just kind of on and off it was like sporadic i i built up and did a half marathon um my junior year which was fun but i had not been in a race it was so funny i had not been in a race I was looking back at my training. I was like, man, what? I had no idea what I was doing. I was, I just built up a long run up to like 11 or 12 miles. And then I don't think I ran longer than like three miles, like on any of my other runs that and during the week, but it ended up working out. Okay. So I ran this half marathon and you know, I got, I was started up in the front. Uh, first one I did was like one forty one. That's great. It was, I, I can, I can That's do that. Amazing. I can do that in my sleep right now. Really? I'm, I'm so, I'm just like, I didn't know what I was doing at all. Like I went out <laughs> And I like, I ran the, like, you know, it's like the, I hadn't been in a race since high school, you know? And I'm, so I'm running out with all the front people. I'm like, I feel great, you know? And I get to the 5K mark where the first timer is. And my 5K was like 19, 20 or something. It was like, like what I would run for a 5K. Right. And I was like, oh, I'm in deep trouble. You know what I mean? Cause I'm not, I could not sustain that for the, right, sure. so I ended up walking in the middle. Like I, it, you know, I just That's was okay. like, yeah. So, um, yeah, my half, I'll run a half now. I, my my best is like a one twenty eight right now, which is I, For I, half. Yeah. Wow. Um, what about a full? Have you done fulls? I've done some fulls. Yeah. How's your time there? Three eighteen. I did in New York. What? I know. Three eighteen. It's amazing. It, it's and I, I <laughs> oh don't mean this God. in a braggy way, but it's like I mean you know it's like you're running. You, everything is relative to where you're at, and and I'm like not happy with my hat my fulls because. Both races, like this last one I did, I, where I ran 318, I was like on pace for 310 until like mile 21 and I blew up and hit the wall. And right. So I know I can go. I know I can be better than that. I would really like to qualify for Boston. 
I'm also aware this is listening to people talk about running is the bo- most boring thing ever. So I apologize to everybody. I, I talk about it a lot because I'm, I'm a runner. Yeah, I, but I'm a I'm a ba- I'm, a, I'm a bad runner. But uh, like I do a marathon. Like my best time for a marathon is like a little under five. That's great. But you run. You ran like more of them. You were. You were. I've run you, a lot you were. I've run fifteen of them. Yeah, I mean that's amazing. I run one in and Tokyo. You ran. I you ran them blindfolded too. Mostly, yeah. Yeah. So I think that's gonna take a. <laughs> I think that counts. Mostly. <laughs> Extra mostly credit. Life. Yeah, I mean, in my mind, like, I don't... It's one of the things that you're talking about running. It's like, when you get really into it, you're not... I think some people run to brag about it. But it, because it's, like, exercise, like, I think, like, sometimes if people just hear you talk about running, it just sounds like you're trying to find ways to brag about the fact that you're working out. <laughs> um, or that you're, like, fast or something, and I just don't... I mean... I run with a bunch of friends at night and, you know, some of them are very much faster than me and some of them are slower than me. And like, it doesn't, there's no, doesn't, there doesn't feel any real competition. Like I don't, if I, I, I like feel no, like, ugh, that's your time. Like people are like, that's like, yeah. Ugh, God, go fuck <laughs> yourself. I'm, I'm always, because I was never, a, you know, I didn't run in yeah. high school or in my twenties. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I started in my thirties, all this stuff. Um, I'm, I'm still kind of like when I, when I hear about runners I'm still I, now I'm now I'm like hey I, I'm I'm sort of a runner yeah you know I'm like you hey, absolutely are I'm, a runner. I'm more interested in it even though I kind of I I, I have a love hate relationship with it right because it's 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 grueling for me yeah um, but when I'm when I accomplish something I'm very proud of myself that's the thing that's I mean I I keep that's all brave you're like everyone should run the New York Marathon like it's just yeah the sense of physical accomplishment I mean it's it's get it's like this black hole on your calendar, you know, like this first time, especially it's like, but yeah, even after that, like, you're like, I don't know how I'm going to do this. Like you, you, even in tra- even training goes very well, you could do it most, you know, 20 or so miles. And it, and at the end of a 20 mile run, your first time you're like obliterated, you know, yeah. and you're like, I'm going to run for another, like six more miles. Like, how is that possible? <laughs> and you just kind of do it. Um, it's it's weird. I think as an adult, there's not a lot of that kind of physical accomplishment. Like I think as a kid, you you, you have that a lot. Um, like you you you, you it's you're growing. You, you're physically able to do more, and to to push yourself to places you weren't able to do before. As an adult, maybe you, you don't try that, that stuff as as much. You know, there's not or there's not as, as much clear metrics. So I think just just the act of completing a marathon is amazing, mm. and uh, that's something that and the New York one especially. It's like the crowds are just so. Well, I was it supposed to run loves the city. 2012, and mm-hmm. I ran, yeah. it got canceled because of Sandy, and uh, I ended up running in Central Park oh my gosh. over and over and over again. It's like we, four or five loops, right? Yeah, uh, four and a quarter, something like that. Um, that's originally what the course was. Yeah, that's what I heard. Yeah. So I was like, oh, that's kind of cool. Uh, but it's but I also heard it's a harder course. <laughs> much harder. Because it's so hilly. So much hillier. And uh and I felt those hills too. And I'm like, oh I have to run these hills again and again and again. Yeah. <laughs> the uh so you've never done the regular New York? No. Uh, yeah, I, I mean I, I couldn't recommend it more. It's just so maybe someday but if you get, right now, get your knees back. Yeah. Right now I'm like I just ran on all seven continents this year. Oh my God. A marathon? I, I tried but uh, because of my injuries and all the sickness yeah. I had, I had to. I did two fulls and five halves. Oh my gosh! And uh, you, what, what? Tell me about going to Antarctica. What the hell? That was brutal, and I think that's what made it so difficult for me for the rest of the year. Um, I was really. I got some sort of an infection or something before oh. I went to Antarctica. It was my first run of the year. Yeah. I'm starting out. Got to start in Antarctica. Antarctica. Yeah. It just turned out that way. Um, so I did that in January, but right, but in like, but a, a couple weeks before, like the end of December, I got, I got sick. I got like a cold. And then because my immune system was down, I caught some sort of an infection, Ugh. which made me just not eat, sweat. Oh my God. Feel weird. My, my skin was weird. And I just felt terrible for like a week and a half. And, um, and then I had to get on a plane and go to Antarctica and go to Chile and stay there for a week. Right. And I was like, well, I'm starting to feel better. Maybe I'll be okay. But for. This, was it a full in Antarctica? It's a full or a half. Yeah. Or a 50K. 
<laughs> oh yeah, let's push. Let's go further. Fifty k. Um, Why run a full when you could run a fifty k? Right. So a couple people did. Not many. Jesus. Um, and then what you do for this marathon group? You stay in Chile, and then at some point during the week, you don't know when. They don't know when. You're gonna fly to Antarctica. It's just based on the weather. It's based on weather, and then um, and that's what happened. So like me and my friend, my guide. Um, we were walking back to the hotel and we're like, hey, there's a bus there. And he's like, that's probably for us to go. I was like, really? And then we get closer. They're like, hurry up, get your stuff, get on the bus. And I'm like, oh my God. Um, so I, so we get on the bus, we get on a plane, we fly two hours to Antarctica. We get off. It's crazy cold. Of course it's, it's their summer, but it's still freezing right. temperatures and it's super windy. So it's like zero degrees. Yeah. Um, and, and they set up tents because you're going to stay overnight oh my God. and then run in the morning. Um, so it's three per tent. I didn't sleep the whole night. It's light out probably, right? It's light for almost the whole thing. Um, but even still, I just could not sleep. But you're sleeping on rocks, basically. Yeah. And they give you, like, little mats, but that didn't help right. a whole lot. And I was, like, anxiety and all this stuff. I already, in, in like, a beautiful hotel room, I still have anxiety. Right. Um, and I still might just get a couple hours of sleep. Um, so I got no sleep. I haven't eaten. I was sick. I haven't trained in a couple weeks. Right. Um, so I get dressed and I'm like, okay, all right, all right. I'm excited. I'm here. Let's make the best of it. Let's do this. And uh, and the course is basically you're going to be running back and forth uh, for like, you know, it's like a few miles and you're just going to keep running it until you hit uh, 26 or whatever you're going to do. But it's, I'm not used to trail running. I, I train on a treadmill. Right. Uh, so it's a trail. And it's rocks and it's snow Oof. and it just snowed. So there's like three huge mounds of snow you have to climb over. <laughs> so now it's an obstacle course, basically. Oh my god! Um, so me and my my guy and I sweat. So like I start running, I immediately break out in a sweat, which makes me even colder. Oh yeah. And about two miles in, I tell my guide, I go, Dave, I don't, I don't think I can do this. I'm I'm a, I feel horrible. I feel so bad right now. I just don't, I'm tired. I'm exhausted. I'm freezing. I'm miserable. And I've never felt like that. Yeah. I've never, in all the marathons I've done, I've never thought, I don't think I could do this. Right. It's either, I hate this, but I'm going to do it. Um, but I've never, especially in two miles, you know, two miles in and with like 24 to go. Oh, God. So I was like, I asked the guy that ran it, I was like, can I do a half and can I just do like this easier part? There was one section that was easier and can I just do it till I hit a half? Yeah. He's like, sure. So that's basically what I did. It still took me four and a half hours. Oh my God. And I think that set me up. My ankles started bothering me after that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My plantar fasciitis got real bad uh, in my foot my back i just had so many problems after that they have that one some company does like you run like seven marathons on all seven continents yeah, this in company. seven days this, this company does it's that. that company i like read an article about that thing i was like that's just crazy he, the guy that ran it uh he talked to me about doing seven halves and seven continents he was like hey you interested in doing seven halves and seven continents in seven days i was like think so <laughs> <laughs> you're like most of the time on the plane yeah it's just you're sounds mostly like on a plane when do you sleep i don't and and uh part of my traveling this year was to kind of see the world right and enjoy where i'm at and stuff like that you know so like eh, i mean it sounds kind of cool to say you did right but i don't know if i i enjoy running is just like very peaceful for me i really enjoy it. and yeah. i've enjoyed the process of like trying to get better and like understanding how my body works and how training is. Um, so yeah, I like, I want to like, the only reason I'm still running fulls is I want to like try to qualify for Boston and like run that, which I still need to get like well, how, a little bit faster for. What do you have to? At my age is to run pretty much three. Uh, three yeah. hours? I, oh. my, I was hitting those, that pace in training last year and then I got hurt. 
and then I get, how'd you get hurt? I just started having this weird leg weakness. I, I like I'm crossing over my legs, and so I'm not using my my hips or so and glutes were just like not doing anything. Yeah. So it's just overloading my quads. So I'm still kind of trying to figure that out and um get back into some like steady mileage because I you know would have a week of forty or fifty miles and a couple weeks there, and but then you know I would I would not I would get hurt or something. I wouldn't be able to hold that. So I gotta like I gotta like build and then up my mileage and and just be consistent with it so that I can get to that yeah. place f- uh, physically. But I'm, I know that I'm not far. It just takes like the consistency. But I, I keep getting I'm a little too big to run as fast. Like most of the people who are running fast are the marathon runners are are, are short and and you know super skinny. light. Yeah, I, I'm like 180. It's it's like a little. And you're tall. How tall are you? Six four. Yeah, you're taller than me. So it's a little, it's a little tall to, it's a, li- it's like a lot. Of, I mean, you ca- every weight, every weight you have, you carry, the whole way. Yeah. And like, I get why. Like, I was reading this chart of like, okay, like if you lose like, like if I lost like five pounds, that like would be like make my like marathon like two minutes quicker, wow. which is crazy. I mean, it's like stuff like that. It's like I don't really have any pounds to lose. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> Um, this is, I, this is what I weigh. And, and so it's like, yeah, I just have to get, get stronger. But I, 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 the marathons are like, uh, I have no interest in like ultra marathons or any of that crazy stuff. It That's just, crazy. um, I like, the, yeah, and stuff like the halves that. are fun to me. Cause the halves, you like push easy. yourself, but you're not, um, like five K's you're like red, red lining the whole time. Like in a five K, like if I run a five K, like as fast as I actually can run a five K, it's pretty much unpleasant immediately mm-hmm. and for the whole time like you just feel like someone's like pushing down on your brain and your chest for like 20 minutes and then you're like oh god that sucks <laughs> like i don't know why people like them <laughs> um uh but half you like you can you kind of work into it and you're never feeling like I, I can't yeah. you know and but then it's still long, but you know it's not so long that you're destroyed yeah. Like running a full like i can't run for a week or yeah. two afterwards you and could you actually do things after yeah half. like yeah yeah. Um, so yeah, I like I like the halves. Those are those are fun. But it is crazy looking back and seeing the kinds of paces I was running. Yeah, even like five six years ago, and just with like I mean, two years ago, I've only really been doing the consistent training for about two years. Um, so yeah, it's cool. I like I'm interested in it, and I've been like following a lot of like pro running too, which like no one else follows. But it's like kind of it's a fun. It's engaging. It's a cool sport. Yeah. Watching a marathon is like a different kind of sporting experience. Like watching it on TV, because people just slowly drop off, and, yeah. and someone makes a move. It's just like a, it's like a, it's tense. Um, uh, I don't know. It's cool. I watched a lot of track and field during the Olympics, mm. and like knew who the people were before going in, which was like kind of cool. Um, Do you run with friends ever? Um, yeah, we watch people with the magnet who, who do some runs. Hey, yeah. Hannah, does she run? She she doesn't run, but um, there's a bunch of people who do a lot of the races here in New York. And uh, I run at night uh, after classes. I just much prefer running at night. And this summer, it's just like I can't handle the heat. How about the cold? Love the cold. Do you? Oh, yeah. I think you'd like in Antarctica. Uh, maybe too cold there. <laughs> um like forties, you know, is great. Or like mid thirties, that's that's ideal. Well, mid thirties with no wind. If there's no wind, which there wasn't, the day we ran in our in our the wind stopped. That's nice. So it was probably freezing temperature. It was probably mid low thirties, mid thirties. I can deal with other, that. You know, I saw other people just wearing like they were used. to I would run in shorts. I run in pretty much in shorts up down till fifteen. Wow. Uh, arms and hands get cold though. My face yeah. gets cold. Yeah. People, some people. I mean, there are people who run negative degree temperatures and stuff. I don't. I don't quite have the gear for that. You have to get like. Yeah. Special face gear. Yeah, I bought all sorts of gear for Antarctica. Yeah. Uh, running. Yeah. <laughs> I haven't run in almost two months now. Yeah, I'm on the shelf currently for. I got my my knee started hurting after the marathon, so I'm. Mm. Rolling out my IT band. Did, did you run the person. New York this year? I did. Yeah, that's why I ran three eighteen. Wow! Um, Congratulations. Thanks. It's really fun. I, uh, yeah, I really like running that race every year. It makes me fall in love. With How New many York. have you run now? Three, three. I've done the last three. Three New Yorks. Yeah, it's uh, 16, you just 15, like lo- it's just like love the city. It, it, the support is so genuine, and like, I think as you're running, you're like, 
it's just cool at first, and then by the end, you're like, as you get delirious, you know, it's like, oh god, like <laughs> you know, if you write your name, people, yeah, shout your name the whole time. Yeah. And there's just like the finish line of like every other race is like what New York's like the whole time. It's yeah. just people screaming and going crazy. And you <laughs> see so many different parts of the city, and you should see my documentary. Yeah, I'd love to. Called Running Blind, about my twelve marathons in 2012. Oh my gosh. I did 12 fulls. All blindfolded, right? Mostly, yeah. That's crazy. Uh, it's a little bit, a little bit peaking. Well, at the the last one I did was in Las Vegas, and it was a nighttime run. <laughs> and I wear the blindfold because of my the sun's bad for my right. eyes. And um, uh, so I ran the first several miles because the sun was still out. And then once the sun set, I took the blindfold off. Cool. And I was able to run. That was my best time. It was like five fifty five, no four fifty five. That's great. That was my time. And um, was it on the strip? Is that rock and roll? Strip, have rock that, and roll. That looks like a cool marathon. Yeah, I recommend. I ran it. the strip just uh, when I was last time I was in Las Vegas. It's like not a easy run to do because you're dodging people all the time. But it was just yeah. cool to like run down the strip. It's just like a crazy place to run. Yeah, I recommend. When it. I was on vacation, I had like a ran like in LA, like up Griffith Park, and then like the next night we were in Death Valley, and I ran in the middle of Death Valley at night with no light, which was so cool. Yeah. So cool. <laughs> so scary. There's no, there's no creatures, there's nothing. Yeah. I mean, there's no humans, there's nothing. No plants. How do you see where you're going if there's no... Just, just the, 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 the like moon. <laughs> Your eyes are just pretty quick. Yeah. Um... And then the next night we were in Las Vegas. We were just on a little road trip. So I ran. It was like a, it was like a good four days in a row of cool places to run. I feel very grateful just getting to run in New York. I feel like I, I'm on a run. Sometimes I'm just like, well, I'm running over the Brooklyn Bridge, <laughs> like running by the Grand Central. Like the the amount of amazing historical stuff I can see even just in an hour or two is just so cool. It yeah. just reminds me of like how. Running in New York really shrinks the, shrink the city for me, mm. and I, I feel more connected to it. And I don't know, I feel like going on foot to all these places, I feel like. Like the subway feels like you're time traveling. Yeah. You, you could be 100 miles away. You have no idea. I mean, so it's cool to kind of know the way. I don't know. Yeah, I get it. Um, I get it. All right, thanks, ma'am. Hey, thank you. Yeah. Thanks for coming by. Do you want to plug anything? Cornfeld and Andrews. Uh-huh. It's every Sunday night at the Magnet in New York City. Um, I'll plug um, the NHL is a great hockey league. <laughs> All right, you're a hockey yeah. fan. Yeah. All right. Uh, I think people should watch hockey. All right. And um, I thought the movie Moonlight was really spectacular. Hey, I've heard that. So I'm going to plug that as well. I'm hoping to get it as a SAG screener. It is really good. <laughs> I haven't seen it yet. I'm going to see The Arrival today. I also like that a lot. Did you? Okay. I really did. I'm going to see that. Double plug. Uh, you're not on the Twitter, on the Instagram. No, sir. You have the you have a website or anything? Nope. Just magnettheater.com. Magnettheater.com. And uh, you're on Facebook, but maybe you won't be soon. I'm on Facebook. I'm not going to leave Facebook, but if you post something on the news feed, I'm probably not going to see it. I'm, I'm avoiding it like the like a bad cold. All right. I have a bad cold. I'm avoiding Avoid it me. like your bad cold. <laughs> there you go, folks. That was my interview with Rick Andrews. Thanks a lot, Rick, for spending some time with me. Not just that week, but uh, with this podcast. Really appreciate it. Good talking with you. Uh, maybe we'll get to improvise together someday. That'd be cool. Um, so there you go, folks. Subscribe to my podcast on the iTunes. If you're able to leave some positive reviews, please do so. Uh, and I guess that's about it. Enjoy your 2017 year. Go take an improv class. Go see some improv shows. There's a lot of good stuff out there. And uh, I'll see you next time. Thanks.